Okay. Um, thank you all for joining us today to talk about water affordability. Um, as most of you are aware, this is a long-standing challenge um, that, thanks in part to the pandemic, is at last getting the attention it deserves. Um, and also thanks to some of the leaders you'll hear from on this call, as well as many groups joining us today to listen in. Um, the federal government is implementing its first National Water Bill Assistance Program. Many states and utilities are stepping up efforts to support low-income ratepayers. And we're excited to hear today from four experts about the challenges that water debt is creating in communities and, um, and some of the solutions that are underway to address the problem, um, including we will hear from Sri Vedashalam from Environmental Policy Innovation Center, which recently released a study um, that looked at existing utility water bill assistance programs. Um, we'll hear from Jonathan Nelson from Community Water Center. Uh, at, at Central Valley, California-based organization that works on a range of water justice issues. We'll hear from Kareen Thibault from Seattle Public Utilities, which is one of the programs that EPIC study looked at. And finally, from Tiffany Ashley Bell from the Human Utility, which crowdfunds water bill assistance programs for families across the country. Um, we're gonna hear from each of the panelists in turn. Um, and we welcome you to submit questions via the Q&A while folks are talking. Um, I have a few follow-up questions for the panelists and then we'll invite, um, we will invite questions from attendees um, in the second half of the hour. <clears throat> um, and you can see bios for each of the panelists in the chat. Um, with that, I'll invite Sri to, um, to share a bit about the topic and um, the recent study that Epic published. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, thank you all for coming to this webinar. I'm uh, pleased to talk about this study, not because uh, you know this obviously is in context to what's happening federally uh, and, and also at the state level, but because this issue is just so overdue. We've uh, you know we've had uh, affordability coming up as a challenge for you know it's bubbling up over many years. Uh, as we see in the next slide, there is uh, the rates water rates have been rising nationally. Uh, across all regions, not one particular region is, uh, you know, left spared. Um, the, the water rates have doubled over the last 20 years. This is from a federal report uh, released by the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, and this goes until 2014. The water rate increase since then has continued at the same rate, uh, so roughly doubling of the rates since 2000. And uh, we have had some spotty efforts at the federal and state levels, but it hasn't been enough. So as you'll see, uh, California is probably the, the best example. Um, on the next slide, we see uh, Senate Bill 222, which uh, recently passed the, the state Senate, uh, develops a water affordability assistance fund. Uh, and, and this is following up on a series of other uh, bills and uh, actions coming from the human right to water uh, that California has sort of taken the lead on this issue. Federally, we had the Low Income Water Customer Assistance Programs Act of 2019. Uh, this was introduced uh, in both Senate and House, but did not advance. Both the members who did uh, play uh, played a leading role in the uh, in bringing this bill uh, no longer served. So it sort of looked like nobody was ready to take this baton. Uh, but then COVID happened. We had uh, you know Congress issue a couple of uh, big relief packages that included uh, more than a billion dollars that went towards for, uh, forgiving debt. Um, and then uh, just yesterday, we had the, the HR 3293, which is the same bill, uh, the, the 2019 version bill, which was a pilot program is now uh, seen as, a, is now a sort of expanded national level program, um, which was, which passed our committee. This would set up a, a federal uh, assistance uh, fund at the, at the national level and allow states and utilities to participate. Um, broadly, we would say affordability interventions can be classified into four buckets. This is, again, thanks to some of the work that Greg Pierce at UCLA and his team have done. Uh, they've divided all of the efforts that utilities have taken into four sort of big buckets. One is rate structure designs, making sure that people who are using low volume water, typically corresponding with low income customers, 
um, have the best rate available. So they are paying much, uh, very little as compared to people who are consuming higher levels of water. Uh, then there are programs that help uh, customers improve their water efficiency. So replacing you know, shower heads and, and toilets with new uh, leak proof designs and, and flow efficient um, uh, fixtures. Uh, then we get into the, the actual relief measures. Uh, many utilities have what's called a crisis relief. So it's a one-time assistance that covers um, you know, outstanding debt up to a certain amount or you know, the last $50, last $100, you know, some amount. So the, the customer uh, gets one-time relief. Uh, and then there is this section called the recurring bill assistance, which is ongoing assistance, goes throughout the year typically, and then the customer gets a, a certain discount on every bill following, uh, following enrollment. Uh, so in this study that we uh, released last month, we looked at specifically the, the recurring bill assistance. Um, and, and so that, that is the one that we were talking about. We studied 20 water utilities across the country. We picked one from, uh, two from each EPA region. So there are 10 regions uh, nationally. So you will see pockets of, uh, you know, utilities not being picked from any state, but we tried to make sure that because state policies have influence on how these programs are structured, we wanted to make sure that you know we have quite a bit of diversity in terms of the locations. Um, next slide. So the first thing we noticed is the documentation requirements, which can be pretty onerous. So um, on average, we would uh, we noticed that utilities required um, you know two documents. So one for the income proof, which you know sort of supports that they, it supports the their enrollment process. And then the other is uh, the proof of uh, utility verification. Uh, those are the most common, but you know, th this can go higher. Some utilities require four or more documents. And in many cases, it's not explicitly stated. So you'd have to call and, and find out how, uh, you know, how many documents are required. And, and this can be pretty, uh, pretty onerous. So for instance, we have uh, utilities like Philadelphia Water Department, which requires information on the name date of birth, social security number of every person living in the household, um, two proofs of residency, and then one proof of income document, income verification, and then an additional form in case there are other hardship uh, criteria. Uh, this can be challenging for households that have mixed immigration status, for instance, um, if one or you know, many of them don't have proper documentation or just simply fear that you know, lack of documentation could you know, lead to adverse outcomes. Um, the, the next slide is probably the meat of the finding. And I would spend a little bit of time here. So, so most cities we uh, looked at offered income-based discount. Uh, four of the utilities out of the 20 did not offer any programs, any customer assistance program. And of the ones that did offer, almost all of them had some uh, support for income-based, so income-based assistance. Uh, one exception, big exception, notable one was the Boston Water and Sewer Commission. Which, uh, which provides uh, relief for seniors and those with dis disability. Uh, they also have to be homeowners though, but uh, there is no um, income screen. Um, and, and low income is defined by every city very differently. Um, so for instance, if, you ha if I have to give you a comparison, Chicago and Houston are cities with roughly similar uh, levels of income. Houston is about 10% cheaper, but nearly all of it, and even in fact, more of it is coming from uh, home ownership costs. It's just cheaper to own a home in Houston as compared to Chicago. Um, a family of three that earns $40,000 annually will qualify for relief in a city like Chicago, but not in Houston, because in Houston, that limit is $22,000. Um, so Houston is um, a city with the lowest uh, income uh, sort of screen. Uh, and so they only uh, help customers with really low income, but not with those who might be in that 20,000 to 50,000, for instance, where most cities actually do offer support. Um, the other uh, big, uh, big finding from our uh, study was the exclusion of renters. So many of these uh, requirements, the low income disability status seniors, they're all independent. So you could be just low income um, customer, you could be somebody who is a senior, you could be somebody with disability. Uh, the, the qualification with home ownership is combined with all of these. So you have to be a homeowner and you have to be low income. You have to be a homeowner and you have to be senior. So that's, that's really a challenge. Because the most of the cities that we looked at, the big cities, 60% uh, or more are actually renters. So that's, uh, that's really going to hurt people who, who rent. Uh, and, and their exclusion from these programs makes these programs less effective. 
Um, you would think that for some of the others, you know, it could be straightforward like seniors and those with disability status, any kind of proof of verification would be sufficient, uh, which is true in most cases, but there are again exceptions. So a uh, utility like the municipal utilities district in Omaha uh, requires uh, a senior to be 60 plus, but with also social security as the only source of income. Um, nine out of 10 seniors do rely on social security, but that only covers 30% of their income. Uh, so they do have other sources of income and that's, you know, that can again be challenging if you live in a city uh, or you're served by a utility like that. Um, some utilities do go beyond, above and beyond. So Philadelphia, um, you know, switching from the bad guy to the good guy here, um, recognizes that you do need assistance of various kinds and outside of these parameters. And so they will help you if you have, uh, you know, what, what's called the hardship requirement. So if you have a job loss, if you have death in the family, so those are, you know, other sort of good ways that utilities do step up. Um, the other um, sort of major finding uh, we wanted to talk about was, you know, how much, how much is it in relation to your monthly bill? So on the next slide, uh, before I get to the slide, um, I wanted to talk about how much is the typical monthly water bill? It's about $26 uh, nationally based on our sample. It ranges quite a bit. So this is $14 in Miami to $50 in Seattle. This is just the water bill, not the sewer bill. Sewer bill is about you know, 1.5 times typically. Again, a lot of variation. Um, so some total, you know, we are looking at a median water and wastewater bill of about $70. And again, given the variation, this could be as low as $40 a month to you know, $100 uh, in high cost cities. The median discount is about 40%. And so that does, you know, that does cover quite a bit in some cities, but in high cost cities, that could be challenging. Um, all of these utility discount programs are set individually by local utilities. So we were actually surprised to see, you know, a remarkable level of consistency in the level of support. So if you look at this chart, somewhere between 35 to 45% is where most utilities land in terms of the percentage of discount. Uh, even though the, the variation in the monthly bill is quite extreme. So it goes from you know, $13 to $50 or so. Um, so that was something uh, sort of quite interesting. Th this means that utilities in um, customers who are living in high cost cities, uh, they still end up bearing you know, a significant portion of the water bill. Um, so a city like Seattle, which has one of the highest in our study, about $50, uh, you know, customers in those cities could, you know, could face uh, additional constraints because you know this is not enough, and money is fungible, as we know. So money that's you know that you save on water bills would go towards food and medicine and other things. Next, we did uh, a couple of case studies uh, just to talk about how there are inherent variations in the uh, assistance programs even within the utility. So uh, we looked at uh, the Missouri American Water, which is a private water utility, and, and noticed that there is you know, a lot of variation within the state program. Uh, if you live in different uh, parts of the state, if you're served in different counties, there are different ways of participating, the levels of support are different. Um, a city like Cleveland Public Water System, which has an excellent um, water assistance program, but restricts it to only renters. Uh, and the one uh, was Seattle Public Utilities, which uh, in, in our study we found to have a comprehensive um, assistance program. And it is also aided by the fact that, uh, you know, the state law is supportive. It allows the utility to use rate revenue, which is a constraint in many other states. So, um, and that's something that uh, our next, one of our next panelists will talk about. Um, so next slide, uh, actually go to the next slide. Can you go to the next one? Yeah, skip this one. Yeah, so we had, uh, we, we made a couple of recommendations. Uh, one is uh, eliminating home ownership to uh, make sure that, you know, renters can participate. And some cities do provide assistance to even those renters whose names don't appear on the bill. So what we call non-account holders. Um, uh, Seattle is a good example. Uh, so that could be another sort of next step of providing support to, to customers who, who do pay water bills in the form of higher rent, but uh, are not necessarily, you know, directly in contact with the utility. So the utility really doesn't know who they are, but uh, they do get water services. Um, the legislation allowing rate revenues to fund customer assistance programs, this is uh, a challenge in many states. Uh, and this is something the state legislatures should be considering. 
Uh, one thing we did notice was these assistance programs issued by water utilities are not really linked with any other program. So there are other utility bills, there are you know federal programs, uh, LIHEAP, uh, you know, food assistance program, social security, they are all disconnected from each other. Very few exceptions. Uh, and we found one to be the, uh, in, in Chicago where you know, LIHEAP is connected with the, the utility billing relief program, um, as it is called in Chicago. But those are really the exceptions. Um, and, and allowing data sharing, you know, utilities of various kinds go through the same process. Electric utilities have um, customer assistance programs. Um, gas utility. So, you know, figuring out a way to allow data sharing can also help. Next slide. Um, documentation requirements are, are really onerous as we saw. Uh, so streamlining the application process could be helpful. Setting up, uh, you know, I call it uniform income thresholds, but, you know, these could be uh, stratified by the cost of the city. So in every state, you could have, you know, tier one cities, tier two cities, um, or tier three, depending on the size. Um, and having some sort of a consistency in the uh, income thresholds could be helpful. Uh, prioritizing lower water rates. I mean, that's probably the best way to provide um, relief to customers is to have low water rates for low um, consumption. So everybody could participate in the process without uh, incurring high water bills. Um, and, and this is a point that, uh, you know, we didn't delve into much, but, you know, there do, uh, there are other fees that utilities charge. So, you know, late payment fees and, you know, water shutoffs is typically a tool used by many utilities to convince, um, you know, water customers to pay their bills. Uh, and I'm anxious to hear how some of the other panelists sort of handle this issue of water shutoffs and, uh, and how we can get beyond um, you know, shutoffs to make sure that everyone can benefit from the water services. That's, uh, that concludes my talk. Um, here are some links. Uh, our report is available on our website. Uh, we also just published an op-ed yesterday on Route 50 that talks, you know, summarizes this uh, this report. Uh, so, uh, you know, feel free to read these and, you know, get back to us with questions. Here's my contact info, and I'll be happy to answer any questions in the next half. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shree. Um, we are going to hear next from Jonathan Nelson of Community Water Center, and we'll hear from all the panelists before going into questions. Great. Well, hi, everyone. Um, and uh, my name is Jonathan Nelson, uh, Policy Director with the Community Water Center. Um, I just want to start, uh, I'm going to breeze through my slides pretty quickly, but I just want to start by saying thank you to Epic for inviting us um, to speak and also for putting out this report. Um, and thank you to Nicole, who, as you're going to see, is, a, a, uh, is good at basically everything she does, but that includes uh, moderating um, and is an important partner for us in terms of lifting up uh, the reality of our water justice crisis um, to the public and to the media. Um, and just looking through the, the uh, participant list, there's a lot of expertise on this call. So really um, also looking forward to the discussion and the questions and just wanna note that there's, um, it looks like a number of community-based organization leaders that are um, on this webinar as well. So thank you for being here. Um, my goal over the next um, couple of minutes is to share just a few perspectives from Community Water Center at this intersection of water affordability, racial justice, and um, trying to recover as equitably as possible from this very unequal pandemic. With that, we can go to the next slide. Um, and I'll start just by sharing a little bit about Community Water Center for those of you that aren't familiar with us. We are an environmental justice uh, community-based organization that is uh, rooted in California's Central Valley and Central Coast. Um, and our vision um, is to ensure that California is a state where everyone has access to safe, clean, and affordable drinking water. And we exist uh, because that's not the reality uh, in our state. We know that that unjust reality is replicated across this country, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Um, we have the privilege of working with uh, farm worker communities, um, the communities that help feed this country um, and are at the forefront of many different types of stressors between our water justice crisis, between the pandemic, between climate change. Um, and for us, we believe that access to safe, affordable drinking water is a basic human right, um, not a privilege. With that, we can go to the next slide. 
Uh, and the type of work we do is we uh, have three strategies that we utilize at Community Water Center, organizing from the ground up to build community power, uh, education, uplifting uh, the reality of our drinking water crisis uh, to the broader public, uh, and advocacy uh, at both the local, state, and federal levels. If we go to the next slide, um, this is such an obvious statement, but it's one that's really important to affirm constantly. Um, and so I'm gonna do that. so now. You know, community water center, the communities we work with have had a safe and affordable drinking water crisis for decades, well before the pandemic started. Uh, and the pandemic just exacerbated that drinking water crisis and that water affordability crisis. Uh, and if we go to the, the next slide, how this shows up in California is we have a million Californians impacted by unsafe drinking water um, every year. And if you go to the next slide, uh, this is what our water infrastructure often looks like. And this is what our water often looks like. And this didn't just happen. This is the result of choices made over years and decades about where we make investments and where we don't, about where certain communities could live and where others couldn't. Um, and this truly is a uh, issue of racial justice and equity. Um, and if we go to the next slide and pivoting more squarely into the focus of today, which is water affordability, we've had a water affordability crisis uh, for decades. Um, and this is just one uh, data point to help illustrate that. Uh, before the pandemic, you know, when things were quote unquote normal, we had half a million Californians that were impacted by water shutoffs in 2019. That uh, is a symptom of a reality that is wrong. Um, and we're gonna explore that you know, more and this report starts to explore that. But a couple things to flag um, in California is that, uh, well, first of all, many of the communities we, we work with pay for water twice. Um, so that's a water affordability crisis. They pay for a water bill that they can't drink because the water's uh, coming out of their tap is unsafe. Then they have to pay for some other source of water like bottled water. So that is one aspect of our water affordability crisis. Another is many of the systems we work with uh, don't have um, capacity to uh, operate a low income rate assistance program. And many of the larger systems um, don't have water affordability programs due to uh, requirements in California that prevent revenue, uh, that, that restrict revenue uh, use, for example, lifeline rates. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, this is the backdrop um, before the pandemic, and this is where we are today uh, because of the pandemic. The pandemic has exacerbated the divide between those that have access to safe and affordable water and those that don't. And what I mean by that is we know in California alone, um, as of the beginning of this year, there's about a billion dollars in household water debt that's piled up. Uh, because of the work of many community-based organizations in California, we do have a temporary water shutoff moratorium that is set to expire. Um, and we have a billion dollars in water debt uh, that affects about uh, 5 million Californians. And by the way, that uh, statistic was current as of January. And at the beginning of the year, the amount of water debt was estimated to be going up by $100 million each month. Um, and you know, for an organization like Community Water Center that believes access to safe and affordable water is a basic human right, um, what we wanna make sure, as you see by this slide, is that we maintain access to water. If we're gonna have a, a equitable COVID recovery or anything close to that, we have to recognize that water is the most basic form of PPE and that if we are going to have an equitable COVID recovery, we have to maintain this cornerstone of public health and for us, a basic human right, which is access to drinking water. And so as we move forward, it's important to make sure that we affirm that just going back to how things were, going back to 500,000 shutoffs a year in California uh, alone, that should not be good enough. If we're gonna recover stronger, we have to put in new protections, new programs and new approaches that recognize our unequal history. Um, so if we go to the, the next slide, um, almost the last slide, just a couple of priorities to lift up. Um, some of this has already been discussed. So we have a little over a billion dollars in federal relief that's being uh, provided to address water debt. Um, that is positive, that's not enough, but that is a step. And we also know that we've got to implement that effectively. And there are real challenges uh, that are already emerges, emerging about how we best do that. 
For example, we want to make sure that undocumented communities um, can access that funding. And there are challenges to that. Um, we also need to make sure that we don't just wipe out the debt right now or do the best we can to do that and then call it a day. We've got to make sure there's a um, equitable long-term program um, like a national water rate assistance program to help make sure that water is affordable. And there's a bill that's already been mentioned, HR 3293, that's moving through Congress. If you're looking for something to work on and support, that's your bill. We also need to make sure that we uh, don't go back to the normal, uh, normal around water shutoffs. If access to water is a basic human right, we have to do better. Uh, we also recognize that we have to make sure our utilities uh, are made whole. You know, many of the small water utilities we work with um, are struggling right now just to keep the lights on. But we've got to put a lot of energy right now into pursuing alternatives to water shutoffs if we believe that this truly is a basic human right. And then finally, just as we uh, fight for much needed investments in water infrastructure, and we know that they're desperately needed, we have to recognize that water infrastructure is important, but that's just one part of the equation. The other part of the equation is making sure that that water is affordable. And so if we're not putting into place programs like a national permanent water rate assistance program, we're just gonna potentially exacerbate the divide between those that can afford to have safe water and those that don't. So we have to fight for the best water infrastructure package we can, and we have to get uh, water affordability uplifted. So with that, if you go to the last slide, my contact information's there. Really look forward to this being a conversation uh, and we have a lot of work to do now and in the coming months. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Um, next, we're going to hear from Corrine Tebow from Seattle Public Utilities. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me today. I'm Dr. Corrine Tebow. I'm a senior policy advisor at Seattle Public Utilities. We provide water, wastewater, stormwater, and solid waste services, garbage, recycling, compost to about one and a half million people and we manage the entire watershed for the city of Seattle. And today my comments are about the potential power of using predictive analytics to improve our customer assistance. Um, thank you. Uh, what I think predictive analytics can help us do really goes to what I see as the core objectives or imperatives of a utility. On the one hand, we never wanna turn the water off or other critical services off for someone who is low income and unable to pay. But on the other hand, we also have to consistently ensure payment and collect payment from those who are able to pay. And we have to do this because uh, not only is it required by Washington state law, we're prohibited in this state from providing discounts or other financial assistance to anyone who is not very low income, but it's also uh, the only way we can fund our operations. We don't receive any general funds or public funds of any kind to fund our operations. Um, it's also the only way we can keep our rates down uh, and affordability is a problem here in Seattle with the cost of water. And the more people we're able to collect rates from, um, the lower those rates are for everybody. It's the only way we can fund critical infrastructure that as everyone here knows is very expensive, but it protects our environment and the quality of our water. And it's the only way that we can fund our customer assistance programs for low income households. So what we really acutely need is a reliable way to distinguish between those customers who are unable to pay and need assistance uh, from those who can pay. And this is why most customer assistance programs you know, have these really laborious income documentation requirements and application processes that are a big lift and a really big barrier for many households. So, the question is, you know, is there a better way to do this? And while we at Seattle Public Utilities are still just sort of embarking on this new exploration, I believe that predictive analytics could be the answer or a big part of the answer to doing it better. Um, so we have a brilliant data scientist at the city of Seattle named Richard Todd, who is building a predictive model. It's a machine learning tool uh, using public publicly available census data and combining it with our internal private utility billing data to generate household level predictions um, on the likelihood that an individual household, an individual customer of ours qualifies for our utility discount program. And um, 
I can talk more about our programs later, but our utility discount program is one of the most generous in the country. It provides 50% off all utility services for enrolled households. So we're still thinking through the various ways that this could be used to improve our customer assistance. But one idea is that we could potentially use it to reduce the income documentation requirements to enroll in our programs. If you have a predictive score that says your household is very likely to qualify, maybe that could suffice for enrollment in the program for auditing and legal purposes. We could also potentially use it to identify households um, that are very likely to qualify for our programs, you know, based on that predictive score, but still aren't enrolled and do very targeted and proactive outreach to those customers. Um, another idea is that we could use it on the back end to identify households that are higher risk, maybe the least likely households to qualify and focus our program auditing efforts on those higher risk households to mitigate the risk of maybe requiring less documentation up front. So in closing, I'm personally very excited about this new technology. And I think that we utilities need new tools to successfully navigate these, what I see as our dual responsibilities um, to provide assistance where it's needed and to collect payment where that's appropriate. And um, those have historically been in tension with one another. And I think that with better data and better tools, they don't have to be. Thank you. Thanks very much, Corrine. Um, lastly, we're gonna hear from Tiffany Ashley Bell from the Human Utility. Um, and as our um, presentations are running a little longer than anticipated, I invite you all to start submitting your questions via the um, Q&A function, and we'll um, start digging into those after we hear from Tiffany. Great. Uh, thank you for, um, hold on. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm really excited to talk about water affordability. It's the thing I've been working on the last seven years of my life um, that I didn't expect to be, but it's a huge problem. And I think that first and foremost, I'll say that I think water is a human right. And I think clean, affordable water should be a human right. Um, we make other things in this country rights, but we we can say, you know, life, liberty, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. But what is that if you can't even take a shower in your own home? That's it doesn't make sense. Um, so again, I started an organization that's called the Human Utility back in 2014, after I was actually um, an innovation consultant for the city of Atlanta, and I read about what was happening in Detroit. And I just, I'm a programmer by training, and I set up um, just a website to find people who needed help with their water bills. Um, and it turned into just an organization that essentially crowdfunds assistance for uh, people who need help with their water bills. We officially help in three different states, but we get demand for assistance from at least 40 of the 50 states throughout the country. So it's, you know, we, we started in Detroit, but we've seen, you know, some of the same issues in Florida, the same issues in Maryland, the same issues with people applying for assistance from here in California, even where I'm currently a student at the business school at Stanford. Um, and one of the things that, you know, I, uh, see a lot, like Jonathan mentioned, this was not a problem that happened just during the pandemic. This is people have not been able to pay their bills for a long time. So, um, you know, we see some of the same situations no matter where we're talking about. So we have families that, you know, the government has essentially left behind. We have, you know, families with low income, senior citizens, people who fall on hard times because of medical issues. We have a lot of cancer patients that we look after um, because again, when you're going through chemotherapy, you sometimes can't work. I mean, some people manage to kind of still go, but you can't full-time work, And but you need to still have water's essential during that process to be able to flush all that stuff out of you. Um, but a lot of utilities don't make provision for that kind of thing. Um, We've seen some utilities, for example, they'll have like a, a, a health, you know, a health rate or a health shutoff uh, moratorium. But in Detroit, for example, it's like three weeks. And what's three weeks when you have cancer? So, um, you know, and like I said, we've seen requests for assistance from 40 of the 50 states. And again, it's some of the same issues. People lose their jobs, medical issues and things of that sort. So, um, again, what my organization essentially does is just crowdfunds money to help people with their water bills. And a lot of places, we've seen everything from someone needing $150 to people needing five or $6,000 because, you know, perhaps they had like a pipe burst um, and, you know, they just, they need assistance because that bill was a shock 
or again, senior citizens who can't pay the bill. And we typically will find that we'll pay probably at least half of it, depending on how much they owe, or sometimes we'll pay the entire bill off. So that's often up to $1,500. We'll just clear that debt for the person. Um, and that's, you know, and we'll do more sometimes on a case by case basis, but it's usually a max of $1,500. And again, that's crowdfunded money that comes from people all over the world that have read about what we've been doing. And essentially we'll just give, we have a monthly giving program that allows people to just kind of donate money monthly. Um, we have a lot of people that give, you know, on the basis of giving them um, from their from their paychecks directly. And again, what it allows us to do is just to kind of have a process where um, the way it works essentially is that people will come to our website and um, and they'll usually find us through Google. We'll see a lot of the time where we'll have a lot of people will come in and just they'll we'll look at the search terms and they'll say things like, you know, water assistance in Detroit or water assistance in Miami. Um, and that's how they'll find our website a lot of the time. But we also work with a lot of different community partners in different cities. Um, because one of the, I'll, I'll admit, one of the weaknesses of our process is that we're online based. And so we rely on community partners to be able to help us to, to fill out applications for folks. Um, but again, the way it also works is, you know, I, I think a lot about what Sri was saying earlier about like documentation requirements. We try to, I, I, for me, it's a fundamental issue of just like being respectful of what's going on with people. And so we don't ask people for a ton of documentation. We want just, you know, proof that you live where you do. We don't require you to own your home because we realize a lot of people don't own their homes. Um, and that shouldn't be an arbiter of whether or not you get assistance or not. You need water to take a shower regardless of whether you own the home or not. So we don't have that as a requirement. Um, we do look for, you know, living under a certain uh, low income threshold. But again, we're not extremely rigid about that. One of the things that's a, a hallmark about um, my background is that I'm originally a tech startup founder. So I like to use a lot of principles from that part of my life in designing our rate program or our assistance program. So we really try to be responsive to a lot of what we're seeing from people. So if we look at our data, for example, uh, Kareem was just talking about data. We, we use a lot of that as well. So we try to pay attention to, you know, if we're seeing a lot of families who are applying with kids at a certain point in time. So we'll try to prioritize those families. Or if we're seeing, for example, one thing that we did during the pandemic, um, looking at my notes, we, uh, we saw that you know people were getting happily the federal check. So we tried to increase the amount of assistance we provided people so they could keep more of the federal money and use that for other things that they may have had problems with. Um, and again, a lot of this just comes from being responsive and just talking to thousands of people and trying to um, design how we're helping people in that way. One of the things we also do is we work very closely with utilities. Um, and that kind of goes into the application process because we'll we'll work with utilities to verify um, a lot of the things that people tell us. So we don't ask for a ton of documentation, um, but we do try to verify. Like you know, if you say your water is off, we'll prioritize your application. So we actually need to know whether or not that's true or not because obviously there's an incentive to say that your water is off when it's not. Um, and so one of the other questions that I was getting is you know what is the incidence of people continuing to need help after they uh, uh, get assistance from us? And we, we don't see a ton of people reapply, but we do see people from time to time who need assistance on an ongoing basis. So sometimes that will be the people with the medical issues, for example, which is expected. And we have some people that we do like periodically continue to support. Um, but I think that, you know, when we have people who reapply, it speaks to the need for more long-term or permanent solutions, especially from the federal level. Um, because we, we've seen in a lot of instances, like poverty is a chronic thing. A lot of people don't go through just like a two or three month block of you know, not working. Some people you know, we've seen, they've been unemployed for a very long time, especially in certain areas where you know, we think about Detroit, for example. Um, a lot of people you know, works in the auto industry and maybe you know, a place they worked closed down and perhaps that was the only thing that they were able to do for that time period. So they're having trouble getting reoriented career-wise. Um, and so they'll perhaps be a more long-term uh, uh, case of needing assistance. And we're happy to help those folks again, um, just depending on like what the situation actually is. Um, but again, you know, we, I think, uh, I think either it's, the, it's tied to the bill that was mentioned earlier, HR 3293, or 
I saw um, the White House says the uh, the low the low income water assistance program now, but I don't if, if I recall correctly, it's not a permanent allocation of funding. So this this you know the work that we're we're doing and what we're seeing from families makes it very clear this needs to be a permanent thing. Like whatever the federal government's doing, like like Jonathan was mentioning, you know the billion dollars is nice, but at the same time like there's a huge need for, for assistance. And you know, we try to do our part in helping the, the most extraordinary, most needy cases, but there's a need for a long-term assistance. So one of the things that we're trying to do more of is, is advocate with and for families. Um, because we, you know, I was excited to see Kareen's presentation because again, data is one of our, our big things as well. And we have tons of data on what's going on with people. We see everything from you know, um, if they submit their pay stubs, we know how much they're making, for example. We know household size and things of that sort. We know, you know, their history of shutoffs. And I think there's a, there's a real opportunity for all of us to use that information to really, really say, like, there's no excuse for what's happening to people and to really um, design programs and legislation even that are really, really responsive to what's going on with families. And again, that's one of the things we're very into you know, adjusting based on what we're seeing from families. But, you know, again, we've helped people in, in several different states at this point throughout the United States. So um, it's been an honor to help people, but again, we shouldn't need to do this for people. Um, one of the really um, last things I'll say is that uh, I think somebody asked in the, uh, the Q and A portion about like, um, uh, what is it, uh, rates versus, uh, rate assistance or, or whatnot versus artificially low rates. I think that, you know, there need to be at least subsidies for people um, or at least, you know, I guess we just say the same thing, but like at least subsidies for people um, where if, we, if you're not gonna like price things a certain way, at least have some money or some sort of, you know, discount that's available to them. And and I think Shree's report, you know, highlights sort of at least the, the spotty landscape around, you know, in some places you'll have a subsidy, other places it's a discount, other places, you know, you'll have a discount for this demographic, but not this other one. Um, and I think there needs to be a more consistent approach to that. So one of our main things is trying to, to advocate for that stuff at this point, based on, again, talking to thousands of people who are in this situation and talking to people every single day, even on weekends, we help people. Um, and I'll just say this, this last thing, uh, I know I've said that twice now, I'll just say this last thing, um, you know, with helping people, the way that we work as well is that when someone applies to our program, we can often help people the exact same day they apply, as long as they come with, you know, the documentation we ask for, which usually isn't a lot, it's proof of residency, um, it's uh, your ID and, you know, proof of income if you actually have a source of income. So again, we, we try to be respectful of what's happening with people and to go from there, so. Thanks so much, Tiffany. Um, I think the question that Tiffany was referring to is from Janessa Doherty, um, asking about Shree's recommendation to prioritize lower water rates over customer assistance programs. So I'd love to hear from Shree or other panelists just about that and um, the trade-offs between those two strategies. I, I can go first and then uh, definitely welcome others, especially Karine, just since she has the actual job of balancing uh, those two, you know, sort of different uh, different goals from a utility perspective. Uh, but th there is a, a case to be made that, you know, water is not priced, uh, you know, according to its value. So it is under underpriced. So we, we definitely are seeing that, uh, you know, low water rates lead to a, a sort of a growing cycle of underinvestment and then you know big problems down the line but at the same time we also have a critical mass of you know people in every utility service area who cannot afford you know these water bills leading to shutoffs in some cases leading to you know other adverse outcomes you know making a choice between different um, you know livelihood questions so there, there can be, uh, you know, there can be a, a rate plan that subsidizes water, just the lowest volume, and then ramps it up, you know, dramatically. So it does, you know, still give you that benefit in the lower volume. So it obviously equates low income with low volume, which I'm not sure is actually always the case. You know, you could be low income, but have a growing family, older housing that has, you know, leaky faucets and things like that. So 
uh, over which you have no control, like especially you know living with the landlord is not cooperative. Um, so so there could be those situations, but I think that is uh, something that some utilities have done. So um, I can think of Phoenix as one example that has um, that doesn't have a very extensive customer assistance program, but its overall rates are pretty low. Uh, and, of, and of course, Phoenix might be uh, you know sort of an odd example out there. But but I think that sort of a model is is possible, and I'm you know open to ideas from you know other panelists. Yeah, and I, I want to lift up another question relatedly that we got from Sylvia Orduño at um, Minnesota or Michigan Welfare Rights Organization about the difference between affordability and assistance and short term remedies versus long term solutions. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm happy to see somebody from uh, Michigan Welfare Rights. Uh, I know Maureen, she's been a great uh, partner to us. Um, I think there's a huge difference. <laughs> there's a huge difference. Like, you know, what we're doing is, is often referred to as a Band-Aid, and I don't like characterizing it as that, but there needs to be more long-term, um, more long-term assistance. Long-term assistance versus affordability for people. Um, I think of assistance as being a function of there not being affordability, which is kind of obvious, but like, um, I think utilities should be aiming for affordability um, because I, I, think of, I think of assistance as being a post like afterwards sort of thing, like um, because you've not made water affordable, people need assistance. So I think it should be essentially that people don't need assistance. And that comes from either, again, setting your rates a certain way um, where you can still run a sustainable utility um, financially, but at the same time, then if, you, if you're gonna set those rates a certain way, then provide you know, subsidies or whatnot so that people can still contribute to their own bills but it's not done in a way that's extremely onerous because I mean, all, a lot of the people that we talk to, they want to pay their own bills. Like a lot of people tell us, you know, we, we sort of turn into counselors a bit because they, they, they feel ashamed about needing assistance, but they shouldn't be because it's not their, their issue. It's not their fault. Um, but the point of that is that people want to pay their own bills. And so if you had affordable water rates, people could do that um, and then still have a piece that's, provided by the utility, whether that's a discount or again, a subsidy or something like that. So I, there's a very distinct difference between those two. Can I just jump in? Um, I do think, I think it's a really tricky question because I agree that um, like water is unaffordable for a lot of people. Um, it's a really big problem in Seattle. Our bills, our bi-monthly average bill for a single family house is over $400. Um, you know, it hurts even for middle income households to pay that bill. At the same time, we have a drought across most of the West and water is becoming an increasingly scarce, uh, it's always been precious, but it's becoming increasingly scarce. So like, how do we price it in a way that encourages uh, conservation? And I know we've thought about that lifeline rate, which is the low price for low consumption, but we also, um, and we're doing further analysis on this, but we found that that wouldn't necessarily help low income households um, you have to be a low consuming household and often higher income households consume less because they have really efficient appliances or really small households or they have all the newest AMI technology to track their use. And so we're not sure what rate structure would actually make it affordable and price it where people would conserve it. So at Seattle Public Utilities, we actually have two different kinds of assistance. And I think this has really helped us meet the different needs in our community. One is an ongoing 50% discount for the lowest income households. Um, and that's for a family, of, a household of four in Seattle, it's about $72,000 um, where we set that limit at. And that's you know ongoing support of 50% off your bill. So that helps people who are kind of chronically unable to pay their bill. But we also have emergency assistance um, that's sort of a one-time um, credit of up to just over what a, a bi-monthly bill would cost, about 450 bucks once a year. And that helps people at higher income levels who maybe don't need the ongoing discount, but they might have an emergency, a financial emergency, a big medical bill or a expensive car payment, and they really need assistance for a short period of time. So I think that if utilities can manage to have those two different things, they meet different needs and different people where they're at. So it seems to be working here. Thanks, Kareen. And I know we have a direct 
question for you as well. And you have a hard stop at noon um, from Morgan Shimabuku at Pacific Institute um, asking about potential applications for the tool you highlighted um, with other low income customer assistance programs in the city, county or state. Yes, um, I think it has tremendous potential for identifying folks for all kinds of different programs. Our data scientists keyed it into our specific income threshold for our utility discount program, which is 70% um, of the state median income, but we know a lot of programs are close to that or under that. And so we could also identify households if they qualify or are likely to for our utility discount program, we could also connect those people with other programs that we think they're likely to qualify for. Um, there are data sharing problems and privacy issues, so we'll have to work through that because we're using private internal billing data to inform that. But we certainly want to maximize the use of the data we have while still being respectful of people's privacy. Thanks, Karine. Um, uh, I have a question from Debbie Neustadt. Um, has anybody found that a high volume user gets a lower rate and that that impacts the rate charged to lower income? Um, uh, users um, and causes it to be higher. I would need our finance people here to answer that. Sorry. Fair. Um, I don't think so, though. I think we do have tiered, um, you know, tiers for a certain amount of CCFs, and the, the more CCFs, the more the cost goes up. I do think we have a conservation ethic built into that rate structure. Some utilities still do have the uh, declining block rates, so it, it still does in that incentivize uh, users at high volume. Um, and I, this is something that we haven't gotten into, you know, minor point, but utilities do have that conflict, especially uh, in some of the Eastern, you know, utilities. I'm not sure if, you know, this is, you know, something that applies on the Western side, uh, but, you know, more, more consumption, helps the utilities, I mean, especially if there's no actual, you know, volume restrictions, then, you know, more rainfall that comes in, you know, people actually don't water their lawns. And so that's loss of revenue. Uh, and when water is not a constraint, you know, that's a dynamic that plays out. So you could have, you know, utilities actually prioritizing, um, you know, users to use more water because that, you know, typically, typically helps the utility. Um, you know, I, I don't, again, this is not universal. It's some utilities, but uh, that's that's another dynamic that's sort of layered onto you know balancing this you know conservation with having finances and making sure that's sort of the third leg of you know utility finances with uh, how customers are actually able to pay their bills. Thanks, Shree. Um, and lastly, we have a question from Christy Meyer asking about grants to low-income households to help with replacing uh, with with um, uh, purchasing low-income or excuse me low-flow appliances. Um, and pairing that with uh, affordable water rates, utility assistance, and debt forgiveness programs. And I see Sri, you answered that in the chat. Uh, I was, I was typing more. that before I started responding. Um, we, we did not look at that in our report, but I do know some utilities offer. In fact, one sort of um, exception, uh, not exception, one sort of notable instance I can um, quote here is that of Miami, which does not have a low income assistance program. Um, when we were researching the report and as we were finishing up, we, we noticed that they did start one. We spoke to them, they said they are in, in discussion. Uh, it's, it's, it's not operational. It started, but it's not operational. In, and it's based on voluntary donations. So they're waiting for money to get accumulated. But despite all that, they do have a conservation rebate program even before that. So there are utilities that have one or the other, you know, this one, not the other, some combination. Um, and that can, you know, sort of help in, in different ways, especially if, if uh, flow, uh, you know, water volume is a big problem. So um, another example is San Antonio, which uh, prioritizes this almost to a level where you can get a free plumber. So they want to make sure that you are conserving water as much as possible so they don't have to tap into additional sources of water. And so they have this program where if you say that you have a high water bill, they'll come out and inspect by sending a qualified plumber who is registered with the utility to make sure that you know there are no leaks from your toilets uh, you know your showers and things like that and that could prioritize you know that could help you get that relief in the next bill so it's not you know uh, it's not the kind of relief that you would get you know with an assistance program but it still helps in an ongoing manner 
You know, one thing just to, to add, um, or a couple of things just to add to what was just shared. So first of all, um, programs that help um, low-income households uh, be able to afford water efficient appliances, those are really important programs. We need to continue to support and build those um, because, and this gets back to Sylvia's um, really important question earlier, um, you know, there are, are multiple strategies um, that help us get at this end goal of water affordability. One um, though dynamic that I want to flag, um, and this holds true both for programs that provide you know, water efficient appliances to even just um, affordability or water assistance rather programs themselves to provide bill credits is oftentimes enrollment for these programs um, are low. Um, and one thing that we find certainly with communities we work with is that there's real power dynamics that happen where if you're already struggling, um, the last impulse you may have is to reach out to any um, you know, government entity, any public utility, whatever it may be to ask for help. Um, and whether that's because there's um, sort of immigration um, concerns or whether it's just, you know, you know you're behind on your water bill and you're worried that if you reach out, maybe, I don't know, maybe they'll cut your water off if you don't immediately pay for it. Just that misinformation, that concern, it results in these power dynamics. And so one thing that we find with our water utility friends is they say, well, we've got the X program, why aren't more people accessing it? And I think it's important to continue to, to have a conversation around recognizing there are very real power dynamics at play. And it's really, uh, there's more opportunity on the utility side, as well as with community-based organizations to lean into that um, reality. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, and I think, um, it, Jonathan, Tiffany, and Shri, are you all okay to go a little past the hour? Yeah, I can stay yes. a little longer. But... Great, thank you. Um, uh, we have a question um, from Antonia Agudipe. A major argument by utilities against assistance programs is that it encourages non-payment by customers who can pay. How can you rebut this argument? I, I personally think it's a bad argument. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think about, um, you know, studying, for example, the financial statements of certain utilities. And if you think about like the bad debt amount that they have, I would like to think that from what I've seen, the amount of revenue they collect relative to what's considered bad debt that's uncollectible, it's a small amount of money. So even if there are people who, you know, who can pay who don't, I'm not, I'm not of the, of the mindset that it actually impacts the financial stability of the utility to such a degree where, oh my gosh, we shouldn't have this program that makes sure that senior citizens have water. I think it's an excuse. Um, and again, from, from looking at financial statements of utilities, because most of these utilities are public, so they publish this information. I, I haven't seen anything that just says like, oh my gosh, they have so much money that they're not collecting to, to make that an actual like valid argument. Um, and again, if we think about Kareen's work, for example, there are ways of being able to discern that, you know, this family from a statistical perspective, perhaps should be able to pay their bill. So perhaps we can then, you know, get in the car and figure out why is this family not paying their bill? You know, we, we have census data that can suss out, you know, census data, previous payment history, um, water use history, things of that sort that can be combined to really understand what's going on, and especially like Kareem was saying, using billing data. And I, I just don't, th I think it's a completely, um, it's an excuse, basically. It's a bad one. <laughs> Thanks, Tiffany. Uh, question from Olivia Wine or Ween. Uh, can panelists talk about examples of how to provide assistance to tenants? For example, in Seattle, if the tenant doesn't have a water bill, but the utility also provides electricity, is the assistance placed on the electric bill? Oh, Karin would have been the, the best person to respond to this. Uh, my uh, sense is that it is placed on the electric bill because that is the only sort of relationship the, the city or the utility has with the customer. The water bill is through the, through 
to the property owner. So, so they cannot do that. So I, I, I believe that is the way um, the utility does that. Um, and that's possible because the utility has both um, light and um, you know, the electric and, and water. And some, some other cities have that kind of arrangement, but most cities don't. We have diversified our you know, sources of services. So you know, water is provided by somebody else, electric is provided by somebody else. Uh, oftentimes the jurisdictions don't have a neat overlap. Um, and, and so all of that sort of complicates this. There was a proposal from California um, in, uh, in their plan for affordability to have a renter's credit. So if you are a renter who does not get a water bill, so you're not an account holder, you would get some sort of a credit, uh, you know, a fixed fee that will help you pay down that bill. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, how actually it would be implemented, but, you know, those are, these are the logistical challenges uh, of providing relief to customers you know, and, and all of these require some sort of enrollment. And we've known just, you know, we didn't review that in depth because we couldn't find that data, but typical enrollment rates are about 15 to 25%, not more than that. Um, so we are, you know, creating these programs and then, you know, only a, a quarter or less actually participate of which some of them may not be justified in, you know, the utilities perspective. So not having a program for, you know, a fraction of a fraction of the people who might unjustly benefit, that seems completely wrong. Um, so we should have the program have enrollment because oftentimes the cities do spend a lot of effort in setting up the program, bringing people into the program, you know, doing the documentation, verification, all that. Um, so slimming down some of those requirements could also boost enrollment. Uh, and, and this enrollment is a percentage of the people who actually qualify. And as we know, if renters are excluded, you know, certain other people are excluded based on income, then you're looking at a really small pool of that 25%. So, you know, really, slice of a slice um, going into the end sort of, uh, you know, a cross section of people who participate. Thanks, Shree. Um, and I think we've made it through our questions. So um, thank you so much to our panelists and all the attendees. Um, we'll be sending out the recording after the fact. Um, and will we also include uh, contact information for the panelists, Shree? Yes, we can do that. Fantastic, all right. Thank you for spending an hour. I neglected to introduce myself at the top. I'm Nicole Lampy with the Water Hub and super um, glad to have had the opportunity to learn from you all. Thanks, Nicole, for moderating this session.